So, welcome to the stage, everybody. So we have um, Jimmy O'Keefe from Dublin City University, Catherine Finlay from um, Roscommon County Council, Roisin Jared Smith from the National Federation, and Thomas Rush from the Curricray, Curricray, okay. right? Cree um, Group Water Scheme in County Roscommon. Um, so, like a lot of knowledge up here on, 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 on the podium. Um, some people who are really familiar with the group water sector and others who are new to, to learning about the, about the group water sector. So there's a good mix um, of, of all of that too. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to introduce each, each of the four and then ask them to speak for, for a few minutes addressing the topic of, of the session, which is addressing environmental challenges and opportunities a leadership role for group water schemes, just from their own perspective, from what they've been doing themselves, um, what they know, and, uh, and, and what their kind of thoughts are about where things are going to go in, in the future. Um, and we'll have a little bit of a chat after that then, when, the, when, when each of the four folks have, have spoken, um, and then we'll open it to the floor. So that's the plan. Now I am planning, I know we're running late here, and I'm sure the last thing you all want to be doing is heading home late. So I'm going to keep to the time as much as I can. Um, so we really have about 45 minutes for the session altogether. And uh, the, um, we, we'll, we'll certainly plan to have you out of here by four o'clock then. So without further ado, our first participant is Dr. Jimmy O'Keefe, who's with Dublin City University. So Jimmy recently completed a report with the Royal College of Surgeons Ireland for the National Federation on the value of the group water scheme sector on evaluating intangible assets, services, and their associated benefits in the group water scheme sector. He's going to explain what all that means now in a minute. The report examines the work being undertaken by group water schemes to deliver drinking water services but also their involvement in source protection initiatives to explore the intangible assets of the sector that may often get overlooked. So Jimmy, you might speak to, to, to the audience for, for a bit about that. And I think you should explain what the intangible assets thing means, like in, right. yeah, as well. Um, I was just joking with them at the start there. It actually sounds to me a little bit like the name of a band that might have been playing at the electric picnic, but it's far more important than that. And we're going to hear from Jimmy now all about that piece of research. Brilliant. Thanks, Matt. And uh, thank you very much to the Federation for giving me the opportunity to be here. Um, so as, as Matt said, my name is Jimmy O'Keefe. I'm a lecturer in DCU, and I'm also a member of the Water Institute at DCU. Uh, I'm a hydrologist by training, so I'm, I'm quite comfortable in the, the watery side of things and uh, measuring wells and so on. Um, most of my work revolves around understanding the links between humans, so society in general, and the natural environment. Um, so I, I guess I've, I have that in common with the Federation and with group water schemes in general. Uh, a lot of my work is, has focused on farmers, uh, so I've spent a lot of time talking to farmers in different parts of the world. And uh, more recently, that work has taken me to, you know, to, to Roscommon, of all places. Um, and actually, this is my... So I worked, I did a small job with the group water schemes about 15 years ago when I was in a consultancy. And it involved doing a pumping test in Kilmele uh, in, in County Clare. And I actually ended up getting a very expensive pump stuck down a well. So I'm delighted that Kilmele are still here and still a group water scheme and that uh, they seem to be doing very well despite my, my, best, my, my best attempts. Uh, but more recently, I've been working on a project with uh, the Royal College of Surgeons. And uh, this was trying to evaluate both tangible and intangible assets within the group water scheme sector. Now, that does sound like a little bit of a mouthful, so I'll, I'll try and explain it a little bit. Uh, so tangible assets, I guess, is something we're all quite aware of. That can include the, you know, the physical environment, and it can include things like grey infrastructure, um, pipes, 
pumping stations, water treatment plants, uh, wells. It can also include some physical parts of the environment, so aquifers, surface water bodies, uh, lands and how we use that land. These are all very tangible assets, so things that we can see and things that we can understand. Intangible assets are a little bit more complicated, uh, but no less important. Um, in the case of group water schemes, that includes things like trust, uh, and I think that's something which has come up a little bit already today, and certainly in the video that you've just seen. The group water scheme, uh, certainly the ones that we've worked in, they they're, play a really strong role within the community. Uh, it's one of Ireland's biggest grassroots organisations, so they have that kind of social capital. Uh, if they want to get something done, it's much easier for somebody within a group water scheme to go and talk to a farmer. Uh, and also that farmer has an investment, either you know, they might, may not directly benefit from the group water scheme, uh, but they, have, you know, they, have some, they, they know people in it, it's a part of the community and they're happy to contribute to it. And that's a really powerful thing. Um, it's not something that we're used to seeing within organisations in Ireland, particularly ones that you know, work for more of a top-down approach. Uh, so when we think about intangible assets, that's a very good one. Uh, another one which came to mind, and again, all of this is it's within a report, which was published yesterday on the website, and you're all very welcome to, to look at it and to download it, and we'd very much welcome any feedback that you have on that. Um, but another one that emerged this morning, which, which really struck me, was around knowledge. Um, so there's a lot of institutional knowledge within the group water scheme sector. Uh, a lot of that comes from people who've been in this sector for a long, long period of time. Uh, really, you know, the group water scheme sector depends on that. It's, it's what really keeps everything going. Um, but I think with, with that trust and with that social capital, there's a huge capacity to pass that knowledge down to, to the next generation. Uh, and because, you know, there's a lot of pride. You, know, you can see this, you know, in today you can see that when you go out, when I spend some time in the field talking to people, there's a lot of pride in group water schemes. There's a lot of pride in seeing how they work, how they run, and providing that service to the community. And I think that's another key asset, and potentially that's the key asset, along with engaging students, engaging young people, I think that's one of the key assets which will, which will allow uh, new stakeholders and new members and new board members to, to be brought on board. Um, Am I all right for time? Should for I pass course, on? yeah, I've got another couple of so minutes. There. I guess one other thing, just to very briefly mention, um, another part of the report uh, focused on different ways of examining the group water scheme sector. What we use is a, something called systems thinking, which is, I guess, quite common in engineering. It's how you, you, know, you look at a whole system, and it's this idea that if you change one little thing within that system, it can potentially have an impact everywhere else. Um, so it's not just about bringing water from a, a well or a surface water body into someone's tap, you also need to look at the price of fuel. Uh, it's very hard to think that a war in the Ukraine is affecting group water schemes in, in Ireland, but that is a fact, and this is again something you need to think about. Uh, it's about looking at biodiversity, it's about looking at climate change, um, it's about looking at this very complicated system. And another part of that puzzle is this idea of natural capital. Uh, the fact that you know within our environment we have um, we have aquifers, we have surface water bodies, we have land that brings value to us, and it's also about including that very explicitly within the way that we value group water schemes. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, look, very much looking forward to the discussion. And Jimmy, is the research, is the report available yet? It is. It was published yesterday. So you can go on to the National Federation of Group Water Schemes website and you can download it there. And, and again, we very much welcome any comments. So that work was actually done with some of my colleagues on the stage here. Um, so Catherine and Tom were very much involved. And there's actually quite a few people in the audience who were involved in that too. So we're not, we're not the experts. I'm certainly not the expert when it comes to group water schemes. You are. So it's, it's really about bringing your knowledge and your expertise and trying to make sense of that from, from our point of view. Great. Thanks very much. So Catherine um, is uh, with Roscommon County Council. And I'm sure, like any of you who are involved in group schemes in Roscommon will certainly know Catherine. She administers the Rural Water Programme on behalf of Roscommon County Council, the Supervisory Authority for Group Water Schemes in Roscommon, liaises closely with Group Water Schemes, 
providing advice and assistance while also policing them to ensure compliance with regulations. Mm. Catherine had done a considerable amount of work with the schemes to raise awareness of the importance of source protection before the pilot project phase two commenced and was very supportive to the schemes during the project. The project is coming to an end um, this year and the final reports have been developed by the Federation at present. The learnings from this project will help inform the Rural Water Programme and the River Basin Management Plan. So Catherine, your thoughts on how the, how, um, like what the environmental challenges and opportunities are in relation to the group water sector um, from your experience and, and all the stuff that you've been involved in with them. Okay, I might just go through um, what we're doing actually on the Rural Water Programme and the connection with the source protection. Um, being responsible for the delivery of the Rural Water Programme, but I also work on the public water side with, under a service level agreement with Irish Water. Um, but on this issue, based on a priority programme submitted by Roscommon County Council back in 2019, on behalf of the group schemes, we're delivering the programme of network upgrades under the current Rural Water Programme, with the department approved grant allocation of 2.8 million for a number of priority projects. But to address the issues in this session, um, I refer to the, scheme, the Group Water Scheme Source Protection Pilot Project, which we've been working in partnership with the National Federation of Group Water Schemes and a broad selection of stakeholders. Um, this involves developing full source protection plans, including specific actions to improve the safety and the security of the Group Water Schemes drinking water. Um, source protection has been a priority in Roscommon, although only approximately 14% of our budget has been allocated to this project. Now that's just based on our priority programme we submitted, um, but I, I think, you know, I'm going to go through what we have been involved with, but I think the impact for the low cost is huge, you know, on the source protection side. Some background as to how we got involved in the first place. Um, back in 2016, there was um, the Rathcrohan dye tracing project was undertaken by Tobin's consulting engineers on behalf of Geological Survey Ireland under our previous rural water programme. The survey highlighted the impact of pollution on water sources and I thought this information should be shared and highlighted within the community. So back in 2017, and based on these results, we discussed raising awareness in the community with Joe Gallagher at the time, was our development officer in the Federation. So Joe brought this back to the Federation. This coincided then with the Department of Housing, Local Government and Heritage putting source protection high on their agenda for future funding support. So we set up meetings and invited a number of stakeholders, including the Federation, the Group Water Scheme Managers, Geological Survey Ireland, and others to discuss the best way to raise the awareness. So following initial meetings in Roscommon, the focus of the campaign shifted to developing full source protection plans with the support of the department and under the guidance of the Federation. The Federation proposed to the department that a pilot project be established and see how this might be implemented across the sector. So given that group water schemes do not have regulatory powers to prevent contamination of drinking water sources, collaboration with other stakeholders has been essential to the success of the pilot. Um, we were successful in having the project piloted in Roscommon due to the good working relationship we have established with our group schemes. Um, source protection strategies can only succeed with the active cooperation of a range of statutory agencies and voluntary organizations. Um, whose combined expertise and influence will feed into the process. Um, a number of initiatives that we undertook, um, catchments were delineated. Um, in the early stages, working groups were set up with a steering group and um, within that then further working groups were set up by the Federation to build on creating the framework for protecting water sources and individual source protection plans. Um, that document and a handbook of source protection and mitigation actions for farming was developed also. So the project has included the distribution of beehives to local farming families, trees being provided to primary school children in 88 national schools across Roscommon, awareness campaigns on pesticides and farmers implementing measures to protect the water courses, including fencing off swallow holes and planting at sources. So 
The farming community play a significant role in this project. However, every citizen has a part to play. The emphasis was on raising awareness, education and inclusion. One of the aims of the project is to work towards sustainable farming practices that lead to improved water sources, increased biodiversity and enhancement of climate awareness. The project focus was on farming benefits with environmental outcomes. Many initiatives were undertaken, um, a campaign to raise awareness. We had a one hour live broadcast in Polecat Springs Group Water Scheme on Shannon Side Radio, and that's brought in our, the National Federation of Group Water Schemes, our Group Water Scheme managers, and the local community participated in it also. There were, we had publications in our local newspapers, including promotional piece on source protection project, along with a brochure identifying and promoting good farming practice. Local marts participated in publishing the importance of protecting water sources in our communities. Informative billboards on agricultural practice that can impact on water quality, both positively and negatively, were erected at the marts in the county. By engaging with the farmer, farming community on the critical issue of source protection, we can ensure that our farming activities do not pose a threat to the vital resource. Mitigation measures for swallow holes were developed and farmers encouraged to fence off vulnerable areas of their lands. Um, catchment walks were undertaken by the group water scheme managers to identify further sources of pollution. Um, farmers and contractors were reminded of the importance of proper and efficient nutrient management to help protect the water sources from pollution and promotional videos were also undertaken. The I've planted a tree in my garden is pesticide free campaign saw us deliver 8,000 trees to all the primary schools in the county. And this initiative was to encourage the community to go pesticide free in their gardens and to educate and create awareness in schools. We had the Let It Be campaign uh, initiative, farmers working together to protect their local water source and enhance biodiversity. Bees, highs, equipment and mentoring were supplied to a selected members in the community. In return, the farmers are looking at changing their practices, putting in biodiversity measures and informing the wider community about the dangers of pesticides. Um, the Brussels-based European Landowners Organisation announced that the Source Protection Pilot Project in County of Scammon as the winner of the European Bee Award 2020 for its Let It Be initiative in the category Land Management Practices, thanks to its outstanding contribution to the protection of pollinators. Um, the overall aim of the initiative was to educate the public about the relationship between what happens in a source catchment and the quality of the tap water and to help explain the important role biodiversity enhancement can play in drinking water source protection. To finish off, I'll just say, these initiatives perfectly encapsulate the close links between drinking water source protection, the environment and the local community, with the group water scheme members and the farmers acting as ambassadors for biodiversity enhancement. They are also centered around social inclusion and working together for the betterment of the community in keeping with the ethos of the cooperative movement. So this, the success of this collaborative project in Roscommon means that the initiatives have now been rolled out to other counties across the country. The Let It Be initiative winning the European Landowners Organisation European Bee Award provides affirmation that Europe is keenly aware that leading role being played in Ireland's community-owned drinking water sector. That's Great, thanks Catherine, that's really impressive. Quite a lot there. Um, I, I was interested in you saying that you rolled out, that it's been rolling out the learnings to other counties, which we might come back to um, it, in a few minutes. Just before I come on to Roisin, the, 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 whoever is the owner of 171 LH 371, if they're in the room, it's causing an obstruction outside. 171 LH 371. I don't see any takers out there. Okay, I've done my bit. <laughs> so, th th that was great from Catherine there, just like hearing about the, like a really integrated approach to the whole source protection issue and linking up to the nature issues as well um, and all the various different projects you did. And there's a lot of synergy between what Jimmy was talking about 
in terms of things like social capital, knowledge sharing, all that kind of stuff. You've been doing it, like you're actually doing that in practice. So it's great to hear about that. Roisin, um, who's our next contributor, Roisin Dowd-Smith, is the Development Officer and Climate Action Officer with the National Federation of Group Water Schemes. Roisin is, um, is the Development Officer from the East and the South. She is also the organization's Climate Action Officer. The Federation have embarked in a department-funded project to pilot climate action and biodiversity initiatives across 30 group water schemes, and Roisin is coordinating this project with her colleague Adrian Smith, who you heard from um, earlier this morning when he, when he gave his presentation about the risk um, issue. So Roisin, um, your thoughts um, on where all of this is going to go in the future, uh, like climate and biodiversity too. You know, we've got a climate emergency, a biodiversity emergency, we're talking mainly about the group water schemes here today, but clearly you've been thinking about how they're all connected up together. Yeah. So I suppose, Matt, we'll just start like where we started and now where, we're, where we are, where we hope to go with the whole thing. So I suppose back in the summer of 2019, when the department announced the climate action and biodiversity emergency for the state as a whole, our federation, along with our board, um, created these two new work areas in climate action for myself and in biodiversity then for my colleague Adrian. And as part of this, before we kind of really kind of took off with it, was to look and see what work is currently being done by the group schemes um, nationally at that stage. So, you know, warmingly to us, there was so much great work that had already been completed and many good work underway. You would have seen the video at the start there. So that showed Black Stairs Group Water Scheme um, installing a pumpus turbine, a real novel, unique piece of renewable technology that's not been seen anywhere else in Ireland to date. You've got the examples there of Rath Group Water Scheme and Polecat Springs with their installation of you know, large scale solar panels. And then there was the great schemes like the West Limerick and all the qualifiers there in the Excellence Awards that got a great handle on their water conservation. In many cases, that this may have been financially motivated and financially driven to bring their, their usage and their unaccounted for water levels as low as possible to save money from an operational perspective, but also so in doing so, it helped reduce the carbon footprint. You know, the less water you pump, the less pot water you waste, you know, the lower your electricity bills and your, and your carbon footprint as a whole. So there was a lot of work kind of underway there that we kind of, you know, helped drive on where it was needed. And also it was just great to see that there was a massive appetite in the climate action section already underway. So that kind of let us know where to kind of build on from and what work was needed. From the biodiversity perspective, obviously there's the great work that Thomas is going to be talking about there in Curacree and all the schemes taking part in the source protection pilot projects in Stranudan and the group water schemes there in Tipperary with the, you know, the native Irish woodland trees that they would have delivered to the local primary schools, the pump house pollinator booklets. So all of this work was happening. It led then to you know, publications of the pump house pollinator friendly booklets. It led to all the videos there that we saw at the start, I let it be. Um, you know, I planted a tree. All those great initiatives helped, you know, be, be, become built on the work that Group Water Schemes were already doing and, and have continued to do so as well. So following on from that, as an organisation, we developed the framework documents for climate action and for biodiversity um, in 2020. And that kind of just helped set out our targets, what we want to achieve and go with it kind of in, in, into the coming years. Then last July in, in 21, and um, with the financial support from the department, we officially launched our climate action and biodiversity enhancement strategy for the next three years. As part of this, we have 35 group water schemes currently that have signed up to it from a range of different counties across the country, a range of different sizes. We have very small schemes that are voluntarily ran, large schemes that have management structures in place, DBOs, non-DBOs, because we felt it was important to show that different measures can be done no matter what county, no matter what size, no matter kind of, you know, what the infrastructure is. Some of these schemes are really advanced in certain areas. Some are, are coming at it at a very much, you know, an infancy state. And again, that's important to show, you know, what, what the different metrics are and how it, can be, how it can be progressed on. All the building blocks have been put in place, you know, from the great work the sector has already been doing. And it's just our intention to try and get it more widespread and to take it to the different levels that the schemes, you know, wish it to be taken to. 
As an organisation, we really believe that group water schemes are uniquely placed, you know, to be real vectors for change in this area. The committees of group water schemes are well known, they're well respected, and it's their water supply, it's all the members' water supply. So we really feel that it's a perfect opportunity for the group water scheme and the rural water sector to become leaders in Ireland in, you know, reducing the climate footprint of the water sector as a whole. So. That's that, Matt. Brilliant. Brilliant. That's, that's, that's a great overview of, of the nature and climate work that's going on. Um, and I think we'll come back to this whole multiple benefits thing. You know, there's like water, climate, nature, they're, they're all interconnected. And, you know, if you do one thing for water, maybe you can get a benefit for nature and climate exactly. as well. So why wouldn't you do it, mm -hmm. you know, is, is one of those... those um, um, intangible benefits you know that, that is that can come out of all of the work yeah. that's happening through the group water sector so um our last contributor then is thomas rush who you already saw up on the screen earlier there in the video and uh, thomas is with the curra cree group water scheme he's the manager there the scheme supplies water to over 300 domestic connections in addition to farms and businesses so it's sort of similar scale to Anne's um, uh, scheme that, that, that we heard about this morning. Their scheme was one of nine group water schemes that participated in the source protection pilot that we've heard about already. Thomas became a local champion of the Let It Be initiative. So we're going to hear a good bit more about that now. He's promised me to sing, the, sing it as well, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> for the closing credits. Yeah, there's a guitar behind you there. Just, <laughs> which aims to raise awareness about the dangers of pesticides in drinking water and create buffer zones through the promotion of the importance of bees, including the solitary bee, poor solitary bee, for local biodiversity within their drinking water catchment. The project won the European Landowners Organization's European Bee Award for this initiative in 2021. And Thomas also got a local mental health charity involved in the project to make bee hotels, which were distributed across their membership and catchment to raise awareness. So, you know, we're down now to the, to the individual scheme and what can be done linking the, you know, the, the work of the scheme to, to nature um, and climate and other issues like that. So, Thomas, your thoughts on yeah, where well, all this is going to go and how it can be expanded out and all that kind of stuff. I suppose a bit like Anne there earlier on today, she said she was invited to a meeting in 2002. I was invited to a meeting in 1987, and here <laughs> I am today, so I think I have a few years over on that one. <laughs> but um, our scheme, our, my original involvement with the scheme in 1987 was with an old water scheme that had a very, plenty of water, but a very poor quality. So along with other schemes in the area, we were, became involved in the DBOs and an amalgamation, and four schemes joined together, and we became Curra Creek Co-op. Um, our scheme is provided with the water by Glenagua, they have the, the DBO contract. Um, now I suppose, like all schemes, the one thing you need for a water scheme, you need quality water. And if you have pollution in your source, that is the major issue. So when we talk about source protection, we're, not actually, we're actually talking about the actual scheme. Because if our scheme gets polluted, and if we cannot protect that source, then we haven't a scheme. Then we have nothing, we have nothing to put in the taps for people. So I suppose when the source protection projects were brought to us, it was something that we were very, very aware of. But we were also very aware of the challenges that was going to come to us to encourage people to do things entirely voluntarily. Because there was no legal framework to go into a man's farm land and say, you have to fence off this or you have to do that. So the, the job at hand we had was to encourage the local people. And I suppose by our local involvement, we were able to do that. And the, the fencing projects, the three farmers that became involved in our scheme, they did it quite willingly. And as one farmer said to Sean Carrigan one day, he felt like the cat that got the cream when a major swallow hole in his land was fenced off because it had always been a danger to his, particularly his young livestock. But they were delighted to take part in that part of the project. And I suppose when you start off on something like that, the source protection, somewhere along the line, something pops up and you say, how is this going to have anything to do with what we're actually at? And the Let It Be project was one of those things. Like the, the idea of beehives and water schemes. It's something people often say to me, but like, what has a beehive to do with your water supply? But 
if you look at the science of a beehive, a bee can travel in a three-mile radius around the beehive. And that's close on 20,000 acres of land. Now, if you can create an environment in that amount of land that is going to be friendly for bees by having less pesticides and less sprays, you're going to have less runoffs and less problems at sources, regardless where they are. So they're actually, they're actually a perfect match in their own right. And that's where you have one, you will have the other. And invariably, if, you're, if your pollinators and your bees die out in an area as a result of pollution from pesticides, your water supply is going to be the same way. So it's part of an education process, it's, and it's part of very much a learning curve for us all. And I suppose, <laughs> as I say about a follow-on from one to the other, the, the original um, fencing was as a result of dye tracing that Tobin's done and all the work that the county council done. And we had a job at hand to educate the farmers who were identified in those dye tracings. Because the problem we have in our scheme, and I say that loads of schemes in the country the same way, our source is miles away from our catchment. And that is a hard one for people to get their heads around. And that our water travels eight, nine miles underground before it comes up in the spring. So to go to an area far away from a source and say to the people in that area, we need you to, this, to do this to protect the source over there, you need to have the science. And the science was provided by, to us by the diet tracing that was done with the county council and with the Department of Environment. Without that, we couldn't, we couldn't make an argument because you would be literally laughed at, you know. It's, it's, it's one of those, <laughs> you need the science behind you. And that, that's why the, it's, it's so important to do the research and to continue doing these projects that tell us where the source of the water is actually from. Now, as a follow-on from all these projects, uh, you may have seen the small little bee hotel the, that we made. Um, Sean and myself were talking one day about uh, trying to get all the members of the scheme in some way involved in the bee project. And a lot of the schemes that were out the last couple of years were saying farm schemes. There was things for the solitary bee, there was bee boxes, bug hotels, and everything like that. And by chance one evening, I seen a clip on YouTube of, uh, it was actually in America, your man was making a little bee hotel. It was just a simple piece of timber. And he just put an air roof on it and he bored holes in it. So Sean and myself discussed it. And we were originally thinking of other organizations, but by times I work in and out to areas where there's uh, mental health workshops. And I approached them to see would they come on board with us. And they were delighted to do it. And it was one thing, I, I often went into the workshop where the people there would be making these. And they'd invariably have a chat and they'd be telling me how they were at it and what they thought of it. And they'd be actually asking me the questions. And you know, to me, that, that, that was an education in itself. And when we brought it to the schools, the first point we had when we had a certain amount made, we brought one for every family that was going to the local school. And the teacher rang me the day after and she said, the arguments there was with the kids where there was two or three kids going home as to who was going to carry it home in the evening, you know. But it, it created just that bit of awareness among the children. And it's the one thing I will say, it's the one thing I would be a, a huge advocate of, that when you go into a school, you give a positive message for everything. I, I, I'm not a great believer in putting a sign up on the wall saying, don't do this, don't do that. I much more put something up on the wall and say, this is what you do. And let, let them discover the bad things themselves that they need to, but don't put it in front of them. And that's the sort of my intro, anyways. Very good. So, um, like, that was brilliant, just the, the, the four different contributions there. The, like, there are so many linkages between everything that you, that you all said there in terms of of knowledge, um, learning, um, the whole multiple benefits thing. But what, what I'm really interested in, in exploring with you for a few minutes is kind of linked back to one of the things that came up this morning, um, which I think Barry was presenting about, which is the future of the group water scheme sector in Ireland. I'm a big fan of the group water scheme sector. Like I, I only really became aware of it when I started working in the EPA back in the, in the late 90s, because I was, I was raised in Dublin, so I didn't know about, about them at that time. But the whole community-based piece in it, like the working together bit, is just incredible. And it's not something that you see in other countries. 
to the same level as, as happened in Ireland, you know? So it's a hugely rich thing to have been created in this country. I think you, everybody in this room should be, all be really proud of what you're involved in. Like, it's, it's, fabu it's a fabulous thing. Maybe it kind of came from the cooperative movement going back, you know, um, decades before the start of the group water scheme. But it's, it's something to treasure. And um, so what, what, I'm, what my question to you all, just to get your thoughts on it, is if you put yourselves forward 10 or 15 years into the future, where do you think the group water scheme will be then? Um, and what do you need to do to strengthen it, to build on it, and to make it like even like far more a more successful community-based um, program than, than it is at the moment? So I go in reverse order, actually, Thomas. I'll come to you first on that. Yeah, well. I suppose if, if we go back 15 years to the, the rural water sector 15 years ago, we were probably in a tough enough space that time and we were short of funding. But where we are today is probably an example of where we should see ourselves in 15 years' time, that far advanced again. And it isn't that hard to get local people involved in a community water scheme. People, at the end of the day, people need water in their taps. And it's a bit like everything else. You need the education process. And if you keep people educated to the need to have the good quality water and tell them where the water is coming from and tell them how much of a responsibility they hold to make sure that that water is good. Like if, if, if you turn on your tap in the morning, if, what I have said one night at a meeting a long time ago, if you go out and spray your garden today with weed killer and you turn on the tap in the morning, are you happy the weed killer isn't in it? But it's the same way our group water schemes now, we have to say to ourselves, are we going to be happy with someone else running our water schemes in 15 years time? Personally speaking, I wouldn't like to see the group water sector disappear in 15 years. So it's, it's up to us and it's up to the people on the ground to encourage all our neighbours and the people in the community to become active in committees. And it isn't that big of a job. If, if, if you do make the effort and go out and knock on doors, and as I say, if you can never get two people from, that are involved in some other organisation to come on a committee together, they'll invariably bring, maybe someone else will know them and they'll, they'll be more happy to come into it. It's very hard to pick, pick someone maybe that has very little involvement in the local community and bring them into uh, a group of maybe 10 or 12 people. And invariably, in a large amount of the board, boards, it's 10 or 12 men. And maybe not having that much in common with some of them. But whereas if you can get two people to come together that knows one another, then they will interact with everyone, and then it's an easier ask. So th th that is where we have to strive for. And okay. I, I don't see any reason why we can't achieve it, because rural Ireland, I know this uh, house has been closed up, but if you drive around rural Ireland, currently, uh, particularly in the last six, eight months, the amount of old houses that have been uh, renovated and people moving into them. And they're, they're not all retired couples. An awful lot of young couples are very happy to move to rural Ireland, and they will buy into the community if they're given the opportunity to. And you've also been doing work with the schools, you mentioned yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you see that linking into maybe, you know, like those, the, the, you're, you're probably, are you do, is it mostly with national school or with Well, there's only one national both? school in our, in our area that, yeah. that we're supplying, there's only one national school, but it's important to keep the national schools educated in that the kids know where they're getting the actual water, because yeah. if, if you buy a house in a, in a rural area and you send your kids to the local national school, uh, they may not have a clue that the water is actually coming from a local group. The, 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 the board meeting may be actually taking place in that national school in a lot of cases. The meeting might be there on a Thursday night or a Monday night or whatever, after school hours. So uh, you, you need to educate, uh, tell the, kids, the children the water is actually coming from a, a, this scheme and they will tell their parents, well, actually, you know, it's not Irish water, it's not Roscommon County Council that's giving us the water. There's actually a small group of people that are running the show here and it's them that's giving us the water. Okay. And Roisin, like, the, like with the climate and biodiversity, climate and nature, um, like, if you think about what was going on before COVID, with all the school strikes that were happening and the climate, um, the, the kids really yeah. getting involved in campaigning for mm -hmm. change, you know, and now we've got a government that's, like as the, the county manager said this morning, that everything is kind of being directed by climate. Yeah. That's a huge change, like, in, in three or four years. Like, do you see the, the climate and nature bit been a hook maybe to get younger people involved in, in the group sector 
in, in the future and how would you, how would that how would you see that evolving yeah. Absolutely, Matt. I mean, if we look at what the majority of the questions and discussions were in the earlier sections was about, you know, the energy blackouts and how schemes can cope with that coming into the winter. And that's all linked to the climate as well. Do you know, we, we've just, we're now talking about that. We've come from a period where there were schemes with, you know, low water supply because of, you know, very dry spells. So the climate is impacting how schemes have their water available mm. and in turn how they should use it, you know, in a more mindful way as well. Um, in an ideal situation, Matt, in 10, 15 years' time, I mean, every scheme in the country at the very minimum, and you could argue essentially, would have the very basic infrastructure in place, like what Anthony was saying in his video, metering, to understand how their water is being consumed, how it's being lost, if it's being lost, and how to just have it better under control, both from a water conservation perspective, financial and a climate action, you know, to keep the carbon footprint down. And then building on from that, and the schemes that are already doing it, would be to become more green, to, you know, to kind of lower the costs, lower the carbon footprint even further through innovative technologies, whether it's different forms of renewable energies for the schemes that have low unaccounted for water, because there's no point in schemes wasting 40% of what they pump and then having renewable energy. I mean, like the two are, aren't conducive if that's the way they're being used. And then also we're developing as part of the project um, primary school literature building into our all about water curriculum to educate primary school students on just the importance of where their water comes from how it's treated and also putting in the information about the climate action and biodiversity because it's like thomas said if you educate the, the young people of, of the generation yeah. it will follow through because it's it's really the, you know the, the younger people at the minute who are driving the narrative forward on it because they see how their future is potentially going to look if we continue to kind of go down the path we're going. And how about secondary school? Yes, well, secondary schools, it would be so important. Now, I know we would have kind of, we'd be doing a lot of research with, you know, third education, you know, students kind of in, they'd be working with group water schemes there because it's a win-win, um, and we have the primary schools. The secondary schools is a section, I suppose, if we were honest, that we're not fully targeting at, at the current point. There are group water schemes that would have those types of schools connected, and they would be reaching out to them in the form of, you know, renewable water bottles with the logos to kind of promote it that way. Um, a curriculum and some sort of education awareness would definitely be something that you know we will look right. at doing as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, great. And Catherine, the like, the, 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 I thought what you were describing was it's it's really interesting and potentially very powerful. You know, because you're you have you've got the project going on in one in the county, like in West Common, So you've got all this. You're you know working out how to do the source protection stuff better. But then you're also thinking about how others can learn from that in other counties, you know? So again, I'd love to hear from you your thoughts about how, like say over the next 10 or 15 years, how those learnings from the experimental work that you're doing could help others figure out how to do this stuff better. Yeah, well, in the whole idea of the pilot is to see what impact it will have at the end of the day on the, the measures that we're undertaking, what impact it will have. Um, if you treat the source and protect the source and protect your catchment, along with the awareness, um, you're going to have better raw water entering mm. your treatment facilities. It'll reduce costs. You know, you have less chemical costs. You will have less energy. Um, you know, but the, what we benefit from in Roscommon also is we have an accredited laboratory on site, you know, and they have been very beneficial to us in measuring the water, you know, the, testing the water for us along the, this project. So we've been testing the water from the beginning. We'll test it right through to the end of this year and into next year and we'll be able to analyze that, and that'll be interesting, you know, when we see all of that yeah. data pulled together, yeah. and that should give us good results. Very good. Um, and the, 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 some of the, the issues that came up this morning about source protection, um, where you're having to go kind of beyond the immediate group of members, in, 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 the, in the group water scheme um, yeah. to deal with source management issues. 
How is that panning out in the in the work you're doing in Roscommon? Are you seeing any issues with that, or um, well, the so, success of this has been the collaboration from the very beginning. Okay, yeah. We brought in a lot of stakeholders, and that was thanks to the people in the federation, Barry and the team. You know, we set up um, a working group. There was a steering group set up, and that involved maybe 25 stakeholders. That was a broad spectrum. Right. We had the Department of Housing Local Government, we had the Department of Agriculture, we had the IFA, the EPA, um, a range of um, state bodies, non-state organisations. We had the farming community, we had Chagas, ASAP, all of those people involved, all around the table talking about the issues and the stumbling blocks that they were experiencing okay. now. Great. And because we had everybody around the table, we were able to have the discussion with them and say, well, how can you help? How can you get farmers across this block? Or, you know, yeah, th and yeah. that, that's what had to happen. Yeah, the discussions, you know, that, the, hard, discussions the hard work of the, of the yeah, discussions. Yeah, but people were willing yeah. and um, very yeah. happy to help out where they could. Great. And is there something there then that others can learn from? like in other counties, other catchments, do you think? And well, the Federation have pulled together their documents now, the framework documents, okay. um, for how this can be approached in other counties, and that's what they're doing. Right, um, yeah. And they're, you know, excellent documents created by the experts, scientists, um, you know, that yeah. can guide other, other group schemes to do the same work. Very good. But, you know, ultimately, and as I said in the beginning of my piece was, you know, we have a large budget for our rural water programme and only a small percentage of that was required on our source protection project. But the huge impact that will have is, you know, immeasurable yeah. at the minute. And if that continues, you know, it will benefit in the long run. Yeah, very good. And then to circle back to the beginning, really, about our discussion here with the research piece, um, and like clearly there's like like Jimmy and sure like you're probably thinking, my God, there's great research opportunities just in what we've been talking about here. Um, in you know, getting better understanding of how this all works. Um, yeah. like what are your thoughts on how you would move next with the stuff that the, lear the learnings you had out of your project? That's, yeah, that's a great question, and it's one that we've been thinking a lot about since. So, so this research that we did, um, we started it in April and we finished it in June, so it was a very short time frame. Um, and I guess just to kind of maybe address a few points that have been made so far. So what I, the Group Water Scheme, a bit like yourself, I wasn't as aware of it as, as I would have liked, and it really is. It's an amazing organization, um, particularly you know, when it comes to, to action. And where I'd love to see it, where I, where I think a great aim for the sector would be to have, you know, in 10 or 15 years, to have a sustainable, resilient organization. A big threat to that, I guess, is this, this climate change, as Roisin mentioned, and biodiversity. And these are global emergencies. And it's very hard to kind of comprehend that from, from our very small point, from our very small vantage point. But I guess the fact is, you, you're already doing it. You are already looking at biodiversity, you're looking at source protection management, you're looking at education, you're actually going into schools. I don't know any other organizations that are going to that much effort. And while you're not explicitly talking about climate change while you're doing it, these are all actions which are helping to address climate change and biodiversity. And I think that's, that's really something which, which should be brought up more often. Um, and then to go back to the research side of things, so Tom mentioned during, well, during his, uh, his few words at the beginning, uh, the importance of research. And I think there's two parts to that. So research is about developing our understanding. And we all know in this room that, you know, the water sector, it's, it's not just as simple as taking water out of the environment and, it's, and make it come out of a tap. There's a lot more going on than that. Uh, so research is really about understanding that very complicated system. Uh, the other part of it is evidence. So in order for us, in order for this sector to be sustainable, 
funding is going to be a very important part of all of that. And a big, uh, a key part of getting that funding is, is evidence. Um, so where I'd love to see research going is uh, looking a bit more on you know, the structure around group water schemes. They're all different, so we've only had a single snapshot in Roscommon. What I've seen this morning is that you know, uh, individual schemes across the country can be quite different. So you're, you're facing different challenges, uh, you have different sizes, different environments, different land uses, different sources of where you get your water. Uh, and I think all of these things are important to take into account. Uh, I'd love to see if you know, the systems thinking approach that we've used uh, in our research, if that can be applied in different areas, and actually if that would be useful for the sector going forward. Um, useful of, uh, as a way of highlighting you know, the great work that you're doing, um, and also potentially highlighting uh, challenges in the future, which will maybe help you prepare uh, for what, whatever's coming down the road next. Very good. Um, so, um, I promised you that we would finish on time. So I'm going to do that. Um, what, what, so instead of opening it up to the floor, because if we do that, it will just take too long and, and, and time will go on. But what I'd really like you all to do, just in reflecting on the discussion that we've had here in the last hour or so, um, is when you go back to your own communities, really do think about the question of, like, where is the scheme going to be in 2030 or in 2035? You know, like 2030 isn't that far away now. Like, it's only eight years away from now. So even in 10 years' time, what do you want your, where do you want your scheme to be in that time? Now, the, like the, the most basic answer to that is probably, well, you just want to make sure that at the very least, it's providing really good quality, safe and secure drinking water to the members of the scheme. But then, from the discussion we've had today here, you can see that there may be all sorts of other things that the scheme can, can provide as well in terms of benefits to the, to the local community um, and to the local environment. And to, you know, from a social, economic, and environmental point of view. You know? So it's really worth just having to think about that um, and uh, to, 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 to try and do a bit of imaginary work on where you think things might be. Because that might get you to circle back then to start addressing some of the questions that Barry raised earlier this morning about how do you get kids involved? How are you going to get, who's the next generation of, of, um, of, of board members going to be, you know? Um, and how do you engage them in, in, in the work of the, of the group water schemes? Because ultimately, that's what's going to bring it all to the next level. You know, if you don't get younger people involved, it won't last. It just won't, like, you know. And, like, and it's no different than so many other community stuff, th things that are going on in Ireland. It's like, we were chatting about this last night over dinner. Tidy towns, committees, all these things. It tends to be the same people who turn up, you know, in communities to do the work on these things. And there's, there's a challenge there to involve um, younger people across the board. But it's a really important issue. And I think it's something that the group schemes can really take a leadership role on as well. So, with no further ado on that, I just ask you to um, thank the contributors here in the usual way.